so first of all, I'd like to thank the faculty for the opportunity they give me to spend this year here at the Institute, and also for the opportunity of giving this short presentation. So um, my purpose today would be to talk about uh, this phenomenon of growth of high sub OLF norms. Uh, in the case of some nonlinear Hamiltonian PDEs, and more specifically, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to speak about a uh, Schrodinger equation, and in the second part of the talk, I'm going to speak about a uh, nonlinear half wave equation. So let me start with the Schrodinger equation. I'm uh, taking the, uh, sorry, uh, I'm taking the uh, defocusing cubic NLS. Uh, where the solution here, uh, u depends on time, which is a real variable, and on x, which is either in r to the d or t to the d, and is complex valued. Um, this is a Hamiltonian equation corresponding to the energy that I define here, and as a consequence, the energy is conserved. So the energy of the solution at time t uh, coincides with the energy of the initial condition. Um, the same is true for the mass, and now, uh, you notice that if we put together the energy and the mass, it follows that uh, the Sobolev norm H1 uh, will be uniformly bounded in time. And actually, if you are in dimension one, the same is true for any integer Sobolev norms, because uh, in dimension one, the Schrodinger equation is completely integrable. So then let's go to a higher dimension, um, say dimension two, NLS on the torus T2, which will be uh, my model for this first part of the talk. Um, first of all, we know that this equation is globally well posed in HS as great co greater or equal to one. And by this, I mean that if you start with an initial condition in uh, HS, then there exists a unique global in time solution which stays forever in this Sobolev space. And uh, now it's natural to ask ourselves uh, what is the fate of these global solutions as we make time go to infinity. Um, in order to address this question, um, in a first step, Professor Burgen and Stafilani and later on others proved that we have this kind of uh, polynomial upper bounds uh, on the Sobolev norms of the solution at time t. So in particular, we notice that uh, as soon as we are um, with an S lar strictly greater than one, this bound is actually uh, going to infinity when time goes to infinity. So naturally, um, the further question would be, is there actually an example of a solution which has uh, this, this growth property, Sobolev norms that grow to infinity over the time. And if such an example uh, exists, then what would be the gro uh, growth rate? And the conjecture of Professor Burgan would be that uh, this growth rate is t to the epsilon for any positive epsilon. Okay. So now, um, to make things clear, um, we don't have any answer available for, for these questions, uh, and obvious and more for, for the conjecture, but there, is significant, uh, there are significant partial results that I'm going to talk about in, in a few minutes. So, um, now all these questions are taking place on a torus, right? Yeah, everything is on the torus T2. R, R, no, no. For R2, we have scattering, which means solutions that Nonlinear solutions are close to linear solutions, so there nothing happens. Because, it, because you're in a compact domain, the waves can go in. Exactly, yeah. We don't, we don't have the decay as, uh, as time goes to infinity. So uh, before telling you about the mathematical results, let me tell you about uh, something about the physical relevance of this uh, growth of high Sobolev norms. So uh, the reason why we are interested in such a, uh, such a property is because uh, it captures what it's called the uh, forward energy cascade. So in physics, or more specifically in, uh, in the weak turbulence theory, what this means is that you have some nonlinear system and you see how your energy uh, moves from lower frequencies to higher and higher frequencies over the time. And if you have growth of high Sobolev norms, it's very easy to see that this energy cascade takes place. So uh, it's just sufficient to write your Sobolev norm on the Fourier side. So uh, if you want this, uh, this uh, quantity here to grow, but in the same time keeping the mass constant, uh, then the only possibility is that this psi to the S grows. Or in other words, um, this Fourier transform of U has to be supported on larger and larger psi's as you increase the time. And this is nothing else than the, uh, the forward energy cascade. 
Now, if you want to interpret this not on the Fourier side, but on uh, in the physical space, what this means is that uh, your dynamics will move uh, to smaller and smaller scales. And there we can imagine that uh, a chaotic behavior may, may occur in the end. So um, here are the partial uh, mathematical results. Uh, since I don't have time, I'll just um, say that uh, so the first results are by Professor Burgan, Cooksin, uh, Zahir Hani, uh, Guardia Kaloshin. And I'm going to focus on this result of uh, Coliander kills Tafilani, Takaoka, and Tao, uh, which is what we call the finite time growth of high Sobolev norms. So more precisely what they proved in the context of uh, this Schrodinger equation on the torus C2 is that um, if one is given with a very small constant epsilon and a very large constant k, then they are actually able to build a solution which at time zero is smaller than epsilon and at a later time t is larger than k. Um, their construction is quite impressive and actually uh, all the works that followed, all these, uh, these three papers mentioned here, uh, are based on their construction. Uh, however, the drawback of, of this result is that uh, we don't know what happens after this time t. So the solution might very well keep growing and eventually uh, reach infinity, or it might as well become small again, or it may have any other uh, uh, behavior in between. Uh, and maybe let me finish this uh, uh, brief uh, presentation of the Schrodinger equation with this result of Hani, Posader, Svetkov, and Vicilia, uh, which was recently announced, but there's not yet a, a preprint available for it. Uh, so what they claim to have proved is that they can actually prove an infinite time growth, uh, not for NLS on this torus T2, but on R cross uh, T to the power D. And uh, I don't know much about this result, but it seems that uh, what helps them here is the fact that they have some, uh, some extra decay coming from the R component. Okay, so... Um, let me now continue with the second part of, of this talk, which is about um, the cubic half-wave equation written here. So I'm considering this equation on R, and uh, absolute value of D here is uh, simply a non-local operator corresponding to uh, multiplication by the absolute value, of the absolute value of the frequency psi on the Fourier side. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is an equation which appears in physics, uh, in gravitational collapse. And, and other things. Uh, and it is also in the same family as mod one-dimensional models of um, weak turbulence considered by Maida, McClory, and Tabak. So they actually considered this type of equations with alpha strictly smaller than one, while here we have alpha equal one. Um, the equation is globally well posed in HS, S uh, larger or equal to a half. And the main result I wanted to present you today is uh, a CKSTT uh, type of result for this uh, cubic uh, half-wave equation. Um, it's stated here, and essentially it says that um, if we are given with a very small constant delta, then we can build a solution smaller than delta at the initial time and larger than one over delta at a later time. And we know exactly what this time is. And what's important is that it's expo exponentially in one over delta. Okay, so I'm going to uh, spend the rest of, um, of this talk um, uh, trying to, to, to show you how I, how I got to this result. Can I ask you, though, if, yeah. if you have time less than exponential, then you know it doesn't exist, where does it exist? Uh, yes. That there is, you need that, at least that time to get. Yes, so uh, this is the kind of uh, Nikoroshev type yeah. theorem yeah. you're referring to. So um, the first natural thing to do is um, to actually, uh, instead of looking at your whole half-wave equation, to look at uh, a resonant, uh, the resonant dynamics of this equation. And to get this resonant dynamics, actually in this case, you only need to solve this, uh, this uh, simple system of two equations. Um, so here the absolute values comes from the fact that I have absolute value of D in my equation. Uh, and then these alternated sums come from the fact that I have a cubic nonlinearity and one of the factors has a conjugate. 
So you have this system and uh, it's very easy to see that uh, the only solutions of the system are uh, when all the four frequencies have the same sign, either all positive or all negative. So um, if you take the case when they are all positive, then what you get is that the resonant dynamics uh, is actually given by this equation here, with pi plus being the projection onto non-negative frequencies. Um, this is an equation called the Zego equation. It was introduced uh, uh, rather recently in 2008 by uh, Patrick Gerard, who was my PhD advisor, and Sandrine Crelier. Um, and its name comes from the fact that this projector, pi plus, uh, is sometimes called the Zego projector. Um, now, since this is the resonant dynamics, uh, we can prove some kind of approximation result, which says that if you start with certain data, uh, which are small, of order epsilon, then the solution for the wave equation will stay close to the solution for the Zego equation uh, for a long time. And this time is uh, given here. Uh, what's important here is that one over epsilon square is actually the time at which you start seeing the nonlinear effect. So with respect to that, you just gain this log of one over epsilon. So it's a long time, but it's not very long either. Okay, so now let me shift your attention from this wave equation to the Zego equation and tell you what are the main properties uh, of the Zego equation. So first of all, it's still Hamiltonian. Um, if we look at it in the space L2 plus. Uh, L2 plus is the space of L2 functions, but which have only, uh, which are supported only on positive frequencies. And we can also see this as a hard space of holomorphic functions in the upper half plane. Um, now, in terms of Sobolev norms, uh, we can easily prove that the Sobolev norm H1 half is uni uniformly bounded in time. And we have a global world closeness in HS where n is uh, greater or equal to a half. Um, the interesting property of the Zegwe equation is that it is completely integrable um, in the sense that uh, Gerard and Grelier found a lax pair for it. And this lax pair is given in terms of, uh, uh, let's say the main operator in the lax pair is a Henkel operator that I define here. Uh, so since we have an integrable equation, uh, we know that we're gonna have an infinite uh, uh, sequence of conservation laws, which are related to the spectrum of this operator, but we can build, uh, we can build other conservation laws. And for example, we can show that this L2 norm of uh, HPs applied to U are conservation laws. And it's easy to see that this, uh, these conservation laws are actually at the level of the LP norms. And if you use some Sobolev embedding, uh, uh, you see that uh, they are all weaker than the H half norm, which we already knew it's controlled. So it's a rather atypical situation, uh, at least if we compare it to the situation uh, of the Schrodinger equation, where we have uh, integrable system with infinitely many conservation laws, but they don't tell you anything about the higher Sobolev norms. They're all controlled by the H half norm. So uh, to actually get some information about the higher Sobolev norms, uh, you need to work more. You need to find an explicit formula for your solution. And based on, on this explicit formula, the result I was able to, to, uh, to prove is the following. Um, Indeed, we have infinite time growth for this Zegwe equation. Um, more precisely, if you take, say, this simple initial condition, then you can explicitly write what your solution is. It decomposes as this sum. The first term is innocent, while the second term has a pole with imaginary part one over t squared. So uh, you have a pole which is supposed to be in the lower half plane, and as time goes to infinity, this pole approaches the real line. Or in other words, your radius of analyticity goes to zero. And this is exactly what gives you the growth. So now if you make a small computation, you see that the solution grows like t to the 2s minus one in the HS norm. And now what is so special about this very simple initial condition? Well, if you look at the corresponding Henkel operator, it has a double eigenvalue. And actually, whenever we have say a finite rank Henkel operator with a double eigenvalue and all the other eigenvalues simple, you always have this growth phenomenon. So it's always related uh, to the multiplicity of eigenvalues slash the radius of analyticity going to zero. So um, let me make a, a, a small parenthesis here and 
uh, tell you that uh, if instead of looking at the segue equation on the torus, you look at it at on the real line, sorry, you look at it on the torus, there you have a completely different behavior. So uh, there's a recent preprint of Gerard and Grelier um, in which they prove that on the torus, all solutions are quasi-periodic. So in particular, you don't have any unbounded orbits there. Okay. So uh, finally, let me finish by uh, just uh, briefly telling you how we go from, uh, from the Zegua equation back to the half-wave equation. Uh, so first of all, uh, using the growth for Zegua and the approximation, we get a relative growth for the wave equation in the sense that uh, from epsilon, we can reach uh, epsilon times this log. Of course, this is still very small if epsilon is small. But now you can use a, a very cheap trick, which is the scaling invariance of the equation. So this equation is L2 critical. Then if you rescale it uh, by a factor which is in between epsilon and epsilon times the log, then you get indeed this arbitrary large growth uh, in the CKSTT uh, spirit. So finally, uh, let me finish with two, uh, two comments. Uh, there's a work in progress going on with Gerard, Lenzmann, and Raphael, where we're trying to investigate the saturation of the growth of, of sol f norms. So we're trying to see what happens after this growth time. So essentially what we want to prove is that uh, the sol f norms will not become small again. They will stay at some, uh, they will not go to infinity either, but we, they will stay uh, large. Um, and then finally, uh, once we have all this information about this half-wave equation, uh, the natural open question would be to uh, now go to um, the other models from uh, uh, Maida, McClellan, and Tabak and see if there we can rigorously prove this uh, growth of high sub So I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.